Yeah. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Good afternoon. So we are live? Yeah, we are live now. Okay. So um, I might just uh, start. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this um, joint event, um, Swinburne uh, University of Technology from Melbourne, and uh, together with Hong Kong U Space yeah, in Hong Kong, of now. course. Hello, can, can can you hear can you hear me well? Yes. I, I hear some feedback. Um, Okay, so today uh, we, we are very, very lucky to have uh, my, my colleagues here in Melbourne, um, uh, Dr. Matt Epperson. Uh, he's very experienced uh, both from the industry and has been uh, with Springburn for some years. Um, I'm, I'm going to let him talk to uh, introduce himself, but uh, his topic today is uh, flight deck design. I'm going to pass it to Matt. Hey, thank you, Tommy. Cheers for that. Um, hello, everybody. It's nice to be broadcasting live. Um, so welcome from Melbourne. Uh, we're a few hours ahead of you in the future. Um, yeah, as Tom was saying, I work at Swinburne University. I'm one of the uh, lecturers in the aviation department, uh, originally from the UK. I've been with Swinburne for seven years now. Um, I'm not a pilot. I'm more from the management side of things. I worked for an airline for a while. Um, and the reason I got into aviation was really because I'm an absolute aviation nerd and geek. Um, so I just want to kind of maybe talk about my career just because it might be of interest because it's from a slightly different angle. Um, so I'm really interested in uh, flight deck design. I'm a human factor specialist um, uh, and I work in a sort of field we call ergonomics, which is about designing um, how we work with machines. So I'm interested in the way that essentially cockpits have changed over the years. Um, and it might seem like a kind of a small trivial point, but the re I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about the reason why this interests me because it really stems back from my childhood. But if you look from the pictures there from the left to the right, um, in 1903, when we first started flying, uh, cockpits were very, very, very simple. Aeroplanes were very simple. Um, but there wasn't much really in terms of instrumentation. Most of the uh, pilot's job was looking out the window and uh, literally feeling the aeroplane um, with the seat of the pants, as they're called. And then really quickly, so by the 1950s, which is when that middle picture uh, was taken there, which is a Boeing 707, um, which was one of the first types of jets that Cathay Pacific ever used to, and Qantas ever used to fly. Um, those aeroplanes got very complex very quickly and they had loads and loads and loads and loads of systems and people. So in that cockpit, there are four people. There's a, uh, um, a captain, a first officer, a flight engineer and a navigator, and there would be a radio operator on some flights as well. Um, and they had to fit a load of systems into the cockpit and it was really just a case of where they could put them. And then we get to, to nowadays where we're looking at really, really streamlined cockpits that look um, they look a bit like something off Star Trek, right? So they've got very few uh, controls, but lots of screens and a much simpler interface. Um, and in terms of the future and where we're going, that's potentially going to lead us to airliners where, where we have like two pilots nowadays. We might go to an airliner configuration where there's just one pilot um, in the actual aeroplane itself. And Airbus and Boeing and NASA are all studying that as a, as a future way of flying airplanes. So that's where my job is going to get interesting. Obviously, if you've only got one pilot in the aeroplane, things are going to look a bit different on the ground. And there is very much the potential that future aviation systems will look really different. And part of the cockpit might be on a ground system. So that is a picture I say it's modern, that's actually from 2011, from the last flight of the space shuttle. So then it's getting a bit old, but that's the mission control station at NASA. So they basically remotely flew the space shuttle. So in the future, we might be remotely flying airliners with one pilot on the aircraft and a few pilots on the ground servicing lots of airplanes. And so the question that sort of brings for people like me that are interested in these things and people working in aviation is, what are these interfaces going to look like? How are you going to communicate with pilots from ground stations on the other side of the world? How are you going to fly system, uh, fly airplanes and change systems and monitor systems remotely? Um, what if you push the wrong button in a ground station? What's it going to do to people in the air? There's a lot of change going on. Um, so so it's, a, it's, a really, it's actually a really interesting and developing field. 
I just want to talk to you very quickly about why I ever, ever became interested in this field anyway. And it all stems back to um, an accident that happened in the UK when I was about, well, it was 1989, so I'd be six, which now gives away how old I am. Um, but I was only a boy, so I don't remember the details of it when it happened, but I definitely remember it being on the news. And this was the last major airliner crash where people died in the UK and so that's a good news story that that happened in 1989 and we've not had a big event since so uh, that's good but unfortunately this aeroplane um, did crash and it crashed at a place called East Midlands um, it was a Boeing 737 that came down just short of the runway and I remember asking my dad why it happened because I was really young so I don't really understand what was going on and my dad told me what he'd read in the newspaper which was that the pilot's had experienced problems with one of the two engines on the aeroplane and they turned off the wrong engine and the aeroplane then had no power and ended up gliding and just crashing short of the runway East Midlands. And as a kid, that seemed really crazy to me. It's like, how do the pilots, these trained pilots, switch off the wrong engine? It seems like a really simple thing to do. And obviously these people that I trust, these captains in these hat, they'd done, they'd done something which seemed really simple. So moving on from there, um, I kind of, for my because it was burned in my memory from my childhood, I kind of always thought about it, but didn't come back to it until many years later when I went to um, actually my second university to do my master's degree. Um, and we started looking at this topic of ergonomics and I came across this chap called Alphonse Chapanis. And he was a, he was an ergonomist like, like me, but he started his career in the US Army just uh, in the war. And they called him up as a sort of psychologist, design engineer person. And the US Army called him up because a lot of their airplanes in the war were, were not having problems in flight, but they were returning to airfields and, um, and landing perfectly fine. Then as they taxied off the runway, um, the landing gear would retract and they'd fall onto their belly and they'd look a bit like that B-17 up there, sort of looking a bit forlorn and a bit, and a bit bashed up which was expensive and also a bit embarrassing, but also meant that they had operational problems because they were running out of aeroplanes. And to cut a long story short, Alphonse Chapanis went over there and found out that it wasn't anything to do with the technical factors of the aeroplane. It was the, the crews um, who were tired after flying for eight hours on a mission. They were cold, they were beaten up, they'd been shot at for a while as well, so they're probably quite traumatized and stressed out. Rather than what they were supposed to be doing, which was retracting the wing flaps as they turned off the runway, they were retracting the landing gear, um, which is not what you want to do. And what Alphonse found that was they were just reaching for the wrong lever. And you can see my mouse cursor on screen. Um, it's not surprising when you look at the cockpit because all of the levers to do things like raise the flaps and raise the landing gear are located in the same place down where I'm circling with my mouse at the bottom, uh, middle of the cockpit. There are slightly out of view from the crew. So they probably have to touch field to find the lever. They, all those levers look the same and they all work in the same direction. So you lift them up to retract and you lower them to, to lower. So if you're a crew and you accidentally grabbed the wrong lever, you'd, um, you'd raise the wrong thing. Um, and so it's kind of likely that that's gonna happen really. So this is a concept called design error. And this is like setting people up to make errors. And this was fairly, this was a new way of looking at problems to me. Um, so I just want to quickly give you an exercise. We're going to try and do a live exercise very quickly here. It'll take two minutes. If I was designing a cockpit then, um, how could I, what sort of effects are going to uh, um, affect me at my performance? Like Alphonse Japan has found that making the handles the same shape wasn't a good idea. We went on to make lots and lots of study about how not to and how we should best design cockpits. So say I've got um, an aeroplane that's got 16 systems in it, which in a complex aeroplane isn't unusual. Um, I've got this gauge here. This is that little picture in, uh, that I've drawn as a gauge. And if the needle's in the green, everything's fine. If the needle's in the orange or the red, then it needs attention. Whatever system it's indicating has a problem. So I've got 16 systems, so I'm gonna have 16 gauges. So what I'll do next is I'll lay those 16 gauges out and I'll tell you one of them on the net, when I advance the slide, one of them is going to be indicating a problem. The other 15 are not. So your job as a pilot now, or a person running a system is to find the one gauge which is showing a problem. You're right. So in three, two, one, find the gauge.
and I think I'm a master of cockpit design. I've got degrees in it, so clearly this is a really good layout. I don't see any problems with it whatsoever. It's now fine, taking me a couple of seconds to find out to you where it is, and I designed this slide. There it is. So hopefully you've found it by now. And if you haven't, it's here where I'm circling down at the bottom in the middle. So the other 15 gauges are green, and that one is the problem one. So that system we need to pay attention to. Now, think about how long that took you to find and the process you went through. Um, let's do this again. I mean, you might be able to guess what's coming, but I'm going to do this with a slightly redesigned cockpit and lay the gauges out in a different way. So let's see, exactly the same again. 15 gauges are going to be fine. One of them is going to be indicating that something is wrong. So find the, find the gauge that you need to pay attention to. So three, two, one. There you go. How long did that take you? I'm hoping that you found that gauge there much more quickly than you did in the other cockpit layout. And it's not a surprise. It might seem really simple. Um, but actually, that is playing on a psychological effect called a gestalt principle, which is a German word, which means sort of collective. Um, now, what... Um, what that means is that when you are um, looking at that image that's there in front of you, um, you are actually seeing an emergent figure. You're seeing it all. You're not paying attention to the individual pieces. You're seeing a pattern and you're seeing all of those needles are pointing in one particular direction. Sorry, I just need to top the battery. Sorry, just before my battery runs out. So while we are waiting, uh, Max to come back, I think uh, you all, all of you have uh, taken some time to to check the you know the system which you mentioned, right? So about Tommy, so what do you think? Yes, um, well, it's very interesting. Well, how was the first one? Did you pick the pick the um the, the one that has a problem like from the cards? I think the second one is easier, right? <laughs> Yo, it was very obvious. Yes, the second one is much easier. I, I hope in the modern day, the design is now much better. So it's not like the, you know, in the old days where they have a, a gauge everywhere. So, so do you think um, the, you know, any philosophy, you know, or might be particularly copied that you like? Um, yeah, I have, well, I've, I've seen a few copy. I think the modern one, the, the particular one from the, from the, um, Airbus design and uh, my, 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 with, with a lot of new panels that actually were very, very nice. Um, in, in fact, I've spoken to those pilots, they're also, they, they, they actually really like it uh, compared to the Boeing, but I, I think, um, uh, but I, I think Matt will be uh, probably uh, talk about it, um, the, the different um, manufacturers' designs these days. Um, so you should, you should be uh, accommodating the, um, the, uh, the real need from the, from the pilot side. And also from the human factor size, uh, so this this, this is uh, uh, and and also uh, if you look at some of the seven C seven seven three seven max uh, problems, uh, which is awfully empowering the um, the pilots uh, without the pilots' knowledge, that causes a lot of uh, tragedies that are uh, happening. Uh, so I I think it's, it requires some sort of uh, uh, deep thinking uh, in terms of uh, what we need to do for the future deck design. Yeah. Okay, so while we are waiting back uh, for Max to uh, so come back to the live, so let's see uh, how about the you know uh, the you know the any questions uh, uh, from the you know from the audience uh, that you can now raise any questions uh, so that we can uh, you know uh, have uh, some discussion with uh, Dr. Tommy Jung as well, and before and uh, waiting for you see uh, Max coming. Yeah, so let's see what uh, they are interested in. So Tommy, can you can you address some of their questions as well? Yes, uh, I have. If coming from the um from the Zoom, right? The, uh, oh, you can read. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. From the from the uh, YouTube. Yeah, YouTube. Yeah. 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 Around three to four seconds. Start. Yes, uh, most of them are actually talking about the. Uh, um, I'm just read read the the question at the moment. So just give me a little time. Because I think uh, for the you know fight that desire uh, has been a lot of uh, you know uh, discussion. Not yes, uh, there's there's one question. Uh, remote control uh, airliner doesn't seem to be a technological um, question. So uh, what's your take on the potential ethical issues? Um, 
systems kit. Apologies. Hi, welcome oh, back. Hi, Matt. Yes. Yeah. Hello, sorry, we still like, it turns out that the, the power cord was actually off, not on, and that was a technical and the failure. problem, we have just oh. had been a discussion with our Tommy and, uh, you know, yes. about yes, the past, yes, trying, yeah. And trying to look for the questions. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, no, good, 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 good. So, yes. right, we'll yeah, get Some of the questions are very good, actually, um, I'm struggling to answer, so, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that to you. We'll yeah. get on to that, thank we, okay. we hand over back to you first, yeah. Yes. Cool. Let me just quickly share the screen again, then. Yeah, sure. Uh, the screen. So while Matt is sharing the screen, uh, so if you have any questions, just uh, quickly uh, put that on the on the uh, chat. Yep. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, okay. Are we good? Can you see the screen there? Great. Excellent. So apologies for that. Um, the point still stands though <laughs> that. Um, Simply through changing the layout of the of the gauges, we can change the the whole experience. So if I just go back, in this case, the brain had to go to every individual gauge and look at it and go, yes, it's green. No, it's no, it's not. That doesn't. I'll go on to the next one. I'll look at this one. I'll go on to the next one. I'll look at this one. There's a little bit of effort, mental effort, with every step. Whereas in this case, you don't do that. You don't look at the individual gauges. You look at the, the whole cluster as a whole and you go, and your brain likes patterns and it likes order. So it goes, everything is in the same direction. Oh, apart from that little bit there, which stands out to me like a sore thumb and your attention is sort of pulled to it. And that's the sort of effect we've got in our brains from trying to spot predators in the wild. And so we use that effect. Um, so this clicked with me further down the line. I did some more research back with the um, the, keg, well, the 737 crash that I remember as a kid. And indeed, when you look at the cockpit instruments in the 737, I started looking through the accident report and this was part of the problem. So it wasn't exactly the same effect. It wasn't the Gestalt effect, but you can see here in the middle um, that the engine instruments are all clustered together. And this was... A good thing. So, if you're looking for engine instruments, the captain just, or the first officer just looks in one place, but they're actually in a specific pattern. Um, and that you would assume that everything that's on the left relates to the left engine and everything that's on the right relates to the right engine. What in fact happened was that the left engine suffered a problem. And there's a little gauge here that indicates um, vibration. And so because the engine was failing, it was shaking and indicating vibration. The crew looked to the, those gauges to diagnose that fault. And they, they started to say left. And then actually on the transcript, we can see they said the low right engine. And they diagnosed that because these, this gauge was on the right hand side of the two clusters, it related to the right engine. And they diagnosed that the right engine was at fault and then went and shut it down. And that was the problem because actually it was the left engine that was at fault. Now that seems like a very trivial mistake. Like how could they make that mistake? But when they're under a lot of workload, obviously they knew the way the, the, the instruments were laid out, but under a lot of workload, they made an error, a small error that you might make, like dialing the wrong number in your microwave or on your mobile phone, but it had big consequences. Um, and so that kind of stuck with me for years and years and years in terms of just changing little things can actually make serious consequences in, in aviation. And I've since, I went on, I, I was studying at a university called Cranfield in the UK at the time, and my first ever industry job, ironically enough, happened to be working with exactly the same model of aeroplane in, um, in Air New Zealand, which was out of Auckland, but looking at their approaches into Queenstown Airport. Now, if any, I don't know if anybody's been skiing in Queenstown, but it's in the middle of a lot of mountains and getting in and out of there is really complicated. So we were looking at the fact that the, they were gonna get this 1986 designed aeroplane and use a retrofitted GPS system essentially to navigate through the mountains to land on this tiny runway um, with a lake at one end, a cliff face at the other, and 11,000 foot mountains on either side of you. Um, and we weren't telling the pilots what to do. The pilots knew exactly, they, they'd been trained, manufacturing knew what they were doing with the aeroplane. But my job was to go in there with my colleague, uh, my boss, um, Stephen Jarvis on the left there in the top left photo, um, and drill down to look for probable errors. What might happen, not what problems were happening, but what could potentially happen. 
and we spotted dozens and dozens and dozens. Um, so the reason I'm quite proud of this job, it was the only time in my career so far I've made a physical change to a flight deck as the output. And it was so tiny. It's just uh, when my mouse is in the bottom left, you can see there's a little green outline. And that was to highlight one of the buttons over the others that was critical and making mistakes. But that button took 18 months to get implemented and had to go through a Boeing review process. So we were proud of the work. Um, but it was, I think, the culmination to me of saying, you know, there are, there are, this is a worthwhile career and there are lots and lots of spin offs from it and ways that it can go. I've since worked in air traffic control as well, looking at air traffic control interfaces, done a little bit of work with boats, a tiny bit of work with trains, which I'm hoping to do some more with. And actually recently, my most recent collaboration is looking to be with an astrophysicist who's using radio telescopes and groups of people to observe instruments for a radio telescope. And that's kind of interesting too. So it's just another, I guess, an unexpected career direction and one of the other elements of aviation on the ground. Um, and it keeps me happy and it keeps me excited. So I don't have anything more uh, to present at this point, and I'm sorry I disappeared for a while, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions that anybody has. And I did see one pop up to do with linear gauges. I'll go back to the, um, Tommy, while you were monitoring, did you see anything, uh, any pertinent questions? I'm going to go and have a look. Yeah. There's a question there, I think linear bars would be better than radial instruments. Um, that's a really interesting question. There's a whole set of research on whether that is better or worse. And it depends on the scenario. If you look at the Boeing 747, the air engine instruments are linear bars. Um, the, you lack something there. You lack the rate of change of the needle. Um, uh, so you get a lot of information from a circular gauge just by looking at where the needle is on the face and how quickly it's moving. Whereas with a linear gauge, there's less movement and it's harder to interpret. So that is a, a positive for the round gauges, but with linear gauges, they take up a lot less space. So you can fit more in. So there's sort of pros and cons and there's a balance to be made. Um, looking at the question. So Matt, there's an, there's an earlier question from yeah. uh, Ken. He said a uh, remotely controlled airliner doesn't seem to be a technical question. What is your take on the potential ethical issues? Ah, that is a very good question. Yes. Yeah, so technically, it's not the technical part, as you said in the question, Ken, but it's not the technical issues which are the limits. Um, and it is very much, I guess ethical is one way, is definitely one way of putting it, of putting it but it's also a market problem because at the moment, we I don't think our consumers would have confidence to travel on a pilotless aeroplane. I don't think passengers that were traveling around the world would really be comfortable getting in an aeroplane where there wasn't a pilot at the front. And so whilst we might be able to do it technically, at the minute there isn't the demand. As with everything in aviation, we need to go through a, a period of um, very conservative lesson learning. So we need to spend, we need to get a system into operation and show that it's very reliable. Um, and so I think we'll be implementing um, either single pilot remotely operated aeroplanes in maybe the cargo domain um, or non-passenger carrying roles before we then move to remotely piloted cargo aeroplanes before we build up enough experience to say that now we're ready to make this transition. But whether or not we fully get rid of a responsible supervising pilot on the flight deck, I don't know. Um, I suspect that will come down to consumer opinion and public faith. Um, but when you look at the remotely driven cars uh, or automatic cars, people seem to have had more faith in those than they expected. We see a lot of people happy to drive around in their uh, Teslas and whatnot without their hands on the wheel. So who knows? It's very much a human psychology thing. Um, tell me anything else. Uh, there's one about a HUD design about the 787 hood um yes i think that heads up displays are a very good thing um they aren't perfect by any means uh, and in fact i'm doing work at the moment um with an airline we're about to start doing work at the moment with an airline looking at how heads up displays change pilots work um but what it does mean is you can you can stop the amount of time that a pilot isn't looking down at the instruments and is looking outside so Theoretically, you can have them spot threats in their environment more and have them move their head less. 
the only problem is that it doesn't always you you can still be looking in the direction of something and not see it so if it can physically hit your eyes the information but it doesn't necessarily get processed and the problem with hoods are sometimes there can be all that information in the outside world can be very compelling and you're looking at it but even though you're technically looking beyond at the runway you might actually not be noticing what's going on on the runway so there are some issues with things like symbology um, the layout of information and not over cluttering um, things. Uh, but the, I've flown I've, in the simulator, I've flown the 787 a lot with the hood and it's a, yeah, it's a good system. I like it. Okay, so um, there's an earlier question from Matt Yuan and um, from the Aeroflow uh, 821 accident back in 2008, we could clearly see the differences in the artificial horizon, uh, horizon designs could be um, catastrophe as more manufacturers are emerging do you think it's, it could reappear uh, so do you think that uh, I, uh, the question is uh, people um, changing the way that standard designs of instrumentation are do we do could we get the same problems recurring yes potentially I suppose so if people try and find their own solutions um, and move away from sort of our learning about how best to lay designs out however um, and I suppose this is this is potentially a problem in the if you kind of the remote air taxi work where you might get small manufacturers building small airplanes or even general air, aviation airplanes, but we do have a, a very rigid set of um, standards and regulations around um, display formats and the way that cockpit information should be displayed. And so, if you're going to build a certified vehicle, it's very hard to move outside of those um, outside of those limits and prescribed ways of doing things, and for good reason as well. So there's good and bad to that. It means we can't innovate so much. Um, it slows down innovation. So there might be a better way of doing things that we don't get to quickly because of that regulation. But at the same time, um, it means that we are aware of the errors that bad design can form and we've formalized it in regulation. There is actually a new set of, I say it's new since 2013, there's a new regulatory requirement for most cockpits uh, to go through in certification and that they need to go through a whole system human factors review. That means that not just each individual instrument, but the whole cockpit needs to be designed from, um, needs to be quantitatively and qualitatively assessed from a, um, from an ergonomics perspective. So we need to test it with the pilot in the loop and we need to understand the workload implications right from the design phase and think about what potential errors might, might occur. Whereas before it was left to the designer of each individual system, the designer of the, um, the flight instruments, the designer of the hydraulic systems and so forth and so forth. So it's a bit different nowadays, hopefully better. Okay, so, so another question, um, S. Seng, 718, I think. Um, what other factors do, you, do we need to consider when designing the corporate? Um, Lots. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think in the future, it's going to be, I think the future challenge is going to be redesigning a cockpit for um, a pilot that's going to be working with a very complex, well, two, two parts of the answer. A pilot that's going to be working with another person who's remotely located to them. We kind of do that with ATC at the moment and operations, but if they're going to have to work very closely in real time with a, a remote assistance pilot, the means of communication, we're going to have to figure that out. Um, also automation, my big sort of field is looking at how we automate vehicles and how we do that properly. And the current generation of automation probably isn't ideal. I think the biggest consideration we need to make is as we assist the pilot to lower their workload by increasing automation, what are we doing to the pilot's existing role? How do we do that without um, cutting them out of the process so they don't understand what's going on? How can we give them meaningful work that's stimulating but means they also bring their strengths. And as humans, we have, we do have a lot of strengths in terms of our flexibility of thinking and our problem solving abilities. But if we are not included in the design properly, we can't bring those to bear, we can't use those. So that's the way we design automation is gonna be critical to that. Okay, so um, can I move on to the next one? Um, is, is, uh, it basically asked, could you present some of the main problems of a 737 MAX design? <laughs> um, yes, well, there are lots. The 737 is a very good, uh, is still a very good aeroplane in many ways, um, especially when you look at overall systems reliability. However, it has had some um, limitations in its design that are 
due to uh, legacy issues. So the, the need to try and preserve commonality with older versions of the aeroplane as much as possible. Um, and that has meant that probably a whole systems redesign and review of the cockpit, into, um, the way the systems integrate and the way it works has not taken place. And so there are gotchas in there, there are gaps and there are workarounds and there will always be problems with that. I mean, with the 737 MAX, a lot of it came out into the way the auto throttle system worked um, in combination with the, um, the alpha protect, the stall protection system and the, and the various airspeed warnings and all of those combined systems gave us, gave us that terrible um, set of accidents. And so, I think in general, the biggest problem probably with aeropla with legacy aeroplanes like the older 737 systems is that they weren't designed from the ground up as a whole system, unlike a more modern aeroplane would have been. Um, and yeah, so to, to list individual problems, I think it would take a long time. Um, obviously also redundancy. We the, One of the biggest problems with that design was over assumed redundancy or backups of the angle of attack sensors that were feeding information into the system. Um, and that's our biggest defense in aviation is having redundant systems. And so we need to, at a bigger sense, I guess, actually go beyond just the airplane itself and think about the engineering of its design, but also how we certify those airplanes. Um, how we certify an airplane that we are changing. Um, and is it right that we um, actually can think of it as an existing aeroplane just modified, or is it so complex we've actually got to go back to the design and go, is this still as safe as we can make it? And I think it's actually a regulatory challenge for everybody across the world, for all regulators about how we approve changes to existing designs or the building of new aeroplanes. So tell me. Okay, and uh, earlier questions, uh, what do you think would be the biggest new trend in uh, corporate design? Um, cup holders, probably. <laughs> Decent cup holders. No, we did that already. Um, biggest new trend, I'll go back to again, single pilot flight deck. So okay. moving, and there's a lot of research going on around this at the moment for all the big research houses, especially NASA, is how do we design an airliner cockpit that it can be flown safely and efficiently by a single pilot on the flight deck? And there are many ways that might work, but that's going to be the next big thing. Much like in the 70s and the 80s when we moved from having a three-person flight deck where we had a first officer, a captain, and a flight engineer, we went to two people. The next big thing I think is going to be an airliner is going to one person. And that's a big change. That's bigger than the two, three to two. Okay. So, um, well, just a quick question from me. So from the from the screen that, you are, that we are seeing, uh, which one is you? Me? Hello. <laughs> yes. I'll wave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one in the blue shirt. Yeah, both of them are. Oh, right. Uh, sorry, on the screen, uh, actually on the slide. Um, yes. Me, they're both blue shirts, aren't they? I'm in the stripy shirt. So the, the good looking guy on the left is my boss, the, the smile. The one that looks awkward and geeky is me when I was a lot younger on the right. So, oh, really? I, I, I thought the other way around. No, no. <laughs> Funnily enough, this was about, when was this? This was uh, 13 years ago, so I've aged a lot. So this is me. Um, okay. And on the right, this is me as well. This is the approach into Queenstown. So these are mountains all around here. And you basically squeeze down a valley and you turn all the way around. So it's incredibly risky and very interesting. Okay. Well, so yeah, um, you're in New Zealand or is it in the UK? Yeah. Now, this oh, is in New Zealand. So this was before yeah. I moved to Australia, actually. So I was working from the UK. But we, um, this was a very proactive airline. They had, they were doing this, they were the first airline to fly these RNP approaches, they, they, what they call the RNP approaches into Queenstown. And they actually got human factor specialists in because they, they got it all ready to go. They just wanted a, a third, fourth, fifth opinion that it was safe from a human workload point of view. So actually we spent, I spent, two or three weeks in the simulator just simulating these approaches and a lot of time watching them in the real aeroplane to see what potential errors could happen um, and also um, using formal fault tree analysis techniques which is sort of engineering approaches from the oil industry to look at how things could combine and create reliability issues so, yeah. 
Okay, so um, there's one question from uh, Flyby Wireless. Uh, cool. With, with more computer screens, even touch screens, uh, what role do we pay? I mean, do the UI UX uh, um, specialist play versus uh, economists uh, play in the cockpit design? Say that again, sorry, tell me. I've lost my screen as well, my YouTube. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, with, with more computers and even more touch screens, uh, what roles do the uh, UI UX uh, specialists um, versus the uh, ergonomists play in the cockpit design? Yeah, you know, very the, hard the, so. Yep. So user interface uh, special is, is very, very important in, um, in cockpit design. And so ergonomy, er, I use the term ergonomist very broadly. Um, to me, not just the physical interfaces, but actually the whole thinking process as well. But I appreciate in America, it, it means mainly sort of physical layout. Um, so the user interface design, which is a sort of an alternative aspect to how I would describe my job is going to be very important. Um, for it, you, you said touchscreen displays, that's a really important thing. So the new Boeing 777X, the eight and the nine, sorry, are gonna have touchscreen display elements. And we've had touchscreen technology for years, but to actually implement that in a cockpit has been really challenging. You think about it, um, every time you touch a screen, you leave a smear. You don't want a, a screen that's got oily smears all over it. And when you've got a very critical symbol that you might miss. And also just being able to actually reach and touch the displays under all flight circumstances, when you're strapped into your chair under very heavy turbulence, that might actually not be so easy. So you've got, we've got to very intelligently think these things through. Um, so user interface design specialists are very, very, very critical. Menu systems in aeroplanes, you can't, things that you can get away with on your phone, for example, um, you might not be able to get away with in an aeroplane. I happen to think that actually a lot of phone design because it's distributed to such a big market, the user interface is very well thought through. Also because they get a lot of data back from when it goes wrong from their users. So that's, that's great. But if it goes wrong on your phone, that's okay. You can reboot your phone. If it goes wrong in a critical scenario in an airplane and you hit the wrong thing, it's more likely to lead to bigger problems. So we've got to be a little bit more conservative, think a little bit more carefully, but also we will never have the level of data that like commercial, um, uh, these sorts of commodity devices were going to provide us because there's just less airplanes. So there's a bit of complication there. It's a different environment to work in, I think. Um, and the volume of regulation that you have to work around as a user interface designer in aviation is huge as well. Challenging that, good. You see what Garmin are doing. Garmin are doing some really cool things. I, my personal opinion here is that the original Garmin G1000, the ergonomics and the user interface design wasn't very good at all. But actually now you look at the later legacy systems, sorry, the more modern generation systems, they've, they've gone through an iterative cycle and they've actually got a lot better. So um, yeah, it's gonna be interesting. There's a lot of work out there for people with that sort of design experience. Okay, um, we have Ken for two questions. Uh, qu uh, question one, I think, I don't know which one is first, but system one being you being our emotional intuitive and effective parts of our brain, according to Daniel um, Kahneman. Kahneman. Yep. And so my second question is to the, um, to the answer, on, to answer others first, uh, how much force are put into limiting the damages of our system one? Ooh, lot. that's a very well-informed question. I like it. There's some very, um, very good questions here. Um, yeah, probably a really good way of thinking about it. Probably quite a lot, a lot. More attention is being paid to it than has been in the past. So our intuitive side, if you will, and actually an interesting way of looking at this is that the I'm, I was really fortunate to meet one of the designers in the Boeing Starliner project, which is the space capsule that Boeing are building to go to the moon and then to Mars, hopefully. Uh, and a lot of that design focuses around, I guess what you'd call system one, but the sort of the more intuitive side of um, the, uh, the emotion uh, regulation of the crew. Are they gonna last over a long period of time in long missions? Um, how they can place them in a state where they're likely to make better decisions. So, and that comes from things like lighting, cabin environment control, um, the way that they orientate the crew so they communicate with each other. So more and more, I think we're moving away from purely it being about the hard technology to, yeah, absolutely. It being about the way we can deliver information into the cockpit in the way that it just intuitively feels right. 
there's a lot of work in haptics, uh, which is the sense of feel. Um, there's some really interesting work in research in the States where um, you, they're orientating pilots to, uh, or they're giving information to pilots on how they're orientated through subtle subliminal, subliminal cues through, um, through little vibrating sensors all over them. Now, if you were to describe how that worked as a pilot, they probably couldn't. Um, but intuitively, they get a sense of the information they're being given and how that um, tells their brain that they're orientated. And so this was particularly important in helicopter flight when they can go into situations where close to the ground, they kick up dust and they go into what's called brownout and suddenly lose visibility. And the army were losing a lot of helicopters in that way. Um, these more less overt, more sort of covert queuing systems were actually able to improve the performance of crews that suddenly lost visual references. They were able to fly the aeroplane still. They might not be able to describe exactly how they're doing it, but it just felt to them like, you know, we were in an upright position or I needed to move right or I needed to move left. We can be a lot more intelligent with the, the sensory information processing system. So knowing about how the human works is really, really, really important for future design. That's a really good question. I like that. Okay, um, from Jordan, Jordan's son, um, do you think some porn fly by wire could limit the pilot's uh, maneuverability in total electric failures while in traditional fly-by cable? You can still retain some minimum control in electric failure. Yeah, so... Um, technical um, questions. <laughs> yeah, very good questions. That's a, that's a good question as well. It's one that the industry grappled with and still grapples with. Um, in fact, even before fly-by-wire, we've gradually been reducing the level of direct influence that the crew, the pilots have over the control of the aeroplane in the traditional sense. So in, as soon as we had hydraulic control systems, they weren't actually directly linked to the controls, if, especially if that system failed. Um, but I guess it comes to reliability, and there's an equation here that... Um, Total, uh, we, we have sufficient backup systems in the aeroplane that there shouldn't be a case where the crew lose the ability to control it. And that is laid down in the design documentation. So there is a number by which there should be a one in a X chance of that happening. And the aeroplane has enough reliability in it that that shouldn't happen. So you can, you can look at that in two ways. You can, if you are disconnected manually from the physical controls of the aeroplane, you could look at that as being a bad thing, but actually fly-by-wire systems and hopefully future fly-by-wire systems might give us more reliable, well, they do give us more reliable systems, but they might give us more get out of problem op um, opportunities as well. So for example, um, they can think beyond the capabilities of the pilot. If you were to partially lose um, physical control of one of the control surfaces of the aeroplane, say as has happened in the uh, Alaskan Airlines MD-83 accident, maybe it is that the, the intelligent brain of the aeroplane could intuitive, could rapidly think about ways to reprogram itself to use the remaining controls to affect the same level of control in a way that a pilot couldn't, even if they were directly linked to the controls. So it was a big scary thing for the industry at first when we moved to fly-by-wire, it will be Scary again when we move to fly by wireless. Um, when we remove those, if we, if we go in that direction, but but we always work towards reliability equations. Um, and I I don't have a particular concern in that field. I have more of a concern in the input to those systems, i.e., the pilot end of the equation, in terms of room for error and problems that we could create. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Jarvis now. Happened once a uh, coffee spilled to the um, pedestal and um, caused the engine down and then everything down and that was a mess. And what do you yeah. think the weakness of um, such a design? Yeah, that's not great. I read, I think that was on an Airbus A350 as well. And I read recently that Airbus are mandating a cover across the pedestal that has to be installed during the cruise phase or, or at non-critical times of flight when crew might be using coffee. It is a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so this is just the reality of where we, what the, what's going on in that space that we've got to think about. It's not just a place for operating the aeroplane. It's a place for the crew to live for eight or 19 hours nowadays. And so they're still going to have to drink and eat. Um, Single-person flight deck. I remember working this problem 
um, years ago before it was even really being mentioned. And one of the chief concerns was how does the pilot go to the toilet when you've only got one pilot on the flight deck? So there's considerations like that that we've got to think around. And sure, um, I think the solution of uh, putting a uh, installing a plastic cover to go over the controls is a good uh, is a good response in terms of risk management. I have a feeling they're going to have to think about something a bit more sustainable though in the future. I think they'll have to maybe think of other ways around. Maybe, hopefully that won't remove coffee from the flight deck. Maybe it will. I don't know. Um, yeah, and so there was an interesting event on an Airbus A330 as well where a cruise cameras and RAF. A330 Voyager, so a military one, where a cruise um, camera that they were using to take pictures got stuck between, or was placed between the control stick and the chair. And when they moved the chair forward electrically, the camera pushed the control stick forward and disconnected the controls and sent the aeroplane into a dive and the and the pilot uh, weightless for, the, for a period of time as well, which was quite alarming. Um, and the other pilot was off the flight deck and was also weightless and had to sort of float into the flight deck. Um, so yeah, sterilization of activities in the flight deck is a real challenge. Um, and I don't know, that's many problems to be solved and presumably one of the problems that you might face when you're in the industry as well, or if you're in the industry already. Okay, from James uh, Song, uh, do you have time frame when, um, when will the airliners uh, starting to use a single man crew? I, I don't know. I don't know. I think if I had, if I was able to predict that, um, I'd be worth a lot more than I am. Um, I would say, right, okay, I'll be hazard to make a guess. It won't be soon, soon. I think we'll see it. I mean, we already do, right? We've already got business jets, which are, for all essences, the same complexity of aircraft as a large airliner, and they're carrying passengers around, and they are certified to operate single person. But they work into slightly different um, uh, safety standards. So I would imagine we'll see prototype designs with certainly within the next decade. I don't think we'll see operational designs in passenger carrying aeroplanes for another two decades, maybe. But I have been classically wrong. I thought the um, I thought Apple's iPad was a, something that would never catch on. It was a useless invention. So I'm not very good with these things, generally speaking. We'll maybe see it in two years. So any, any chance to get to a zero pilot? Just to what, sorry? I mean, any chance to get to no pilots at all? To get to no pilots? Yep. Do you mean me? No, 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 no. Pilotless. No pilotless flight? I'm not quite sure I'm following the question, Tommy. Sorry. Oh, pilotless yeah. flight. Any chance yeah. to get to pilotless? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think it's an inevitability. Um, I really do. I... I don't know how long that's going to take. I would personally, I wouldn't be comfortable with today's level of technology and capability. Um, but with AI systems, who knows? So maybe I, you, I can't pro, uh, chart the progress of technology. Maybe within my lifetime. I mean, we've got pilot. I mean, effectively, most space vehicles now. The, the shuttle was pilotless. It was remotely operated. Um, and the the latest missions that SpaceX is sending up with Dragon, they're essentially. If you look at the flight decks of those capsules, they're just screens. There's not a lot for the crew to actually do. There isn't really any, there isn't even a joystick in there anymore. It's just remote. It's a question of reliability and public appetite. So we shall see. Okay, so um, we have a question from Mike again. Our electronic flight deck is now a big part of the flight deck. Um, while it is easy to load a huge amount of documents on them, it could be tricky to flip through charts. Is it a good trend? I think electronic flight bags are in general a good trend, yes. Um, there's challenges. And one of the, I think one of the good points that was raised there is the fact that it's, it is tricky when you've got lots of information to find that information. And the integrated electronic flight bags probably uh, have a bound to a bigger set of regulation than the non-integrated flight bags. So the different classes of electronic flight bags. But uh, I've already worked with airlines where some they've implemented, they've got standalone like iPad versions, non-integrated flight bags, and somebody has developed an app in the company that to perform a function, which is great. But there is no checking of the interface of the app and how it works and whether it conforms to design standards, and it doesn't necessarily have to go through the same checking channels. So I think yes, that's going to be very important. 
that somehow we get that good design thinking into electronic flight bag layout as well, which isn't to say that the ones we see already are bad. I think there's some really good design out there, um, but it, it needs to be as good as the design thinking um, that we have in the flight deck. For instance, personalization is always a problem in consumer market. It's great to be able to personalize the interface to change things around to suit you. But when you've got a device that's under critical pressure and you want everybody to be able to use it in the same way, then maybe personalization is not such an easy thing or a good thing to deal with. So we've, we've, we've got to think around those problems as well. Okay, a question from Jeff, Jeff Ming. Um, is there any factors needed to be considered between the clock click buttons and, uh, and the checklists? Um, do you mean as in, kind of the linking between the state of the culprit and the checklist, perhaps, I guess. Um, yeah. Yes. And you'll see that in a lot of modern airliners. So the um, 777 was a good example of it first coming in with electronic checklists. Um, but now the modern airplanes like the A350 and the 787 have a greater degree of integration between the checklist, the electronic checklist and the status of the airplane. So it, the data, there's just more data available. There are more sensors as the centralization of data and the checklist can actually read what's going on in the airplane and know whether a certain instrument is set a certain way or a certain switch is thrown a certain way. And so, yeah, that's definitely good because it enables you then to have a backup. It enables you then to have two checks going on or three. You can have both pilots checking the system and the airplane itself checking itself. So yeah, the more we can do that, the better. Um, but we've also got to consider the role of automation and whether or not we take that role away from the pilot and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, whether they will, if they don't have the information, they're not in the loop, whether they will, they'll need it or not. Okay, we have one question from uh, Robin Hope. Um, Robin, uh, questions about the Boeing uh, robot uh, clock piece arm. What are the possible ways for the captain to communicate and command with, the, uh, with his colleague? The Boeing what, sorry? Um, the Boeing robot called Pilot Arm. Ooh, this is something I haven't come across, I don't think. So this is like, a, I'm guessing this is, or maybe it is something where you've got a remote uh, interfacing um, pilot that can manipulate the aeroplane from, from a distance and the ways to communicate. Um, I don't know if I'm answering the question here because I'm not entirely in the loop on this technology in that case. So these questions really are good. Um, the problem always comes down to communication with somebody, whether it's a physical system or a computer system. Um, if we, if it's a computer, if it's an AI system, I guess this is actually where the chief problem with, or where the way, the way automation is going in the future, it, it's going to be very sophisticated thinking systems, such as AI systems. Communicating with them has always been a problem. Um, if you think of the existing flight management systems and the airplane as AI, the chief problem has always been communicating because we force the pilot to use a clunky keyboard and a very engineering focused sort of old 1980s interface. Um, really that interface needs to be as natural as possible. So voice communications, the way we would communicate with a fellow human. If it is to be a human centered system, we don't need to build the system and have it work and then figure out the way that the human's gonna communicate with it we need to understand the way the human wants to communicate with that system and can easily communicate with that system and then build the system so it can do that. And I would imagine that the easiest way is to do what we do naturally and talk to it or point to things and have it read our body language. So that is beyond the capabilities of AI of intelligent systems at the moment to do reliably and is really where we're going to need to become more sophisticated, I think. Um, we have a question from Flyby Wireless. Uh, what do you think of the synthetic visions and um, holographic displays like Microsoft HoloLens and in clock prick pilots versus remote pilots and in real life versus simulations? Ooh, that's a lot of questions. Yes, very, very technical. <laughs> I'll try and remember them, but I've got very small capacity memory, so I'll start with the first one. Um, synthetic vision systems, uh, I think, wonderful. I think the more the the more information we can add in the more naturalistic way, the better. And I think synthetic vision systems are a very good way of giving us unnatural sort of information. It just looks like the view we see in the outside world rather than sort of symbolized instruments. Um, so that's good. As long as they're implemented correctly, we, there is a risk though that they encourage you to think that you have a level of information that you don't. And there's a couple of 
examples of when first when we got GPS systems, people thought that the never in though they the, the vision looks the picture looks like you know exactly where you are actually there's a degree of error in that system um and so people are placing too much faith in it and then getting into hairy situations now with synthetic vision it's slightly different because the requirements for it to be perfectly accurate are, are much higher um microsoft hololens uh and that those sort of augmented reality solutions i'm really 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 interested in and really watching closely because i think there's an all sorts of opportunity there we can move beyond what is quite an old fashioned way of offering information, which is these flat displays, um, which show symbols and technical information, which there's, there's gonna be a place for that, that's necessary, but to offering information in a more, what I would say is naturalistic way, um, easy to access way, and the HoloLens is a really good, is hopefully that sort of technology, augmented reality is gonna be a really good way of doing that, but it will depend on getting it right. It could also be a really bad way of doing things, we could throw lots of information in there that's really not well delivered and distract the pilot uh, and confuse them, which is a challenge. Um, what was the last quest bit of that question, Tommy? Um, the last bit, I think, is uh, in real life versus in simulations. Uh, oh, um, do you mean single pilot or? No, no, no. Um, holographic displays like Microsoft HoloLens in for clock picks, um, pilots okay. versus remote pilots, and in real life versus simulations. I think he oh. he means uh, whether the the um the holographic displays uh, for use in real life versus in simulations. Um, right. Um. Yeah, I've not worked with many in real with any in real life. Um. So it will be challenging. I'd imagine there's a lot more. So holographic displays in the real world um, where your lighting environment is far more dynamic, where you've got a lot more uh, information going on, I think is gonna be more of a challenge. Um, the uh, interesting case, I guess, is the, this is what they've effectively tried to do with the F-35, right? And the, the very sophisticated um, helmet mounted displays that they've got where it's effectively a sort of hollow lens solution. It's sort of augmented reality you can turn your head in any direction um, and that inf and you can use the sensor information and almost look through the aeroplane itself. But they've had a lot of problems getting that to work um, because sickness, um, because any lag between the system, if you've used a virtual reality helmet so far, they, are, they, they can be very good, but you can't endure them for a long period of time sometimes. And if the, there's all sorts of new conditions where the information lag has to be absolutely minimal so you don't feel... Uh, disorientated and sick and making sure that 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 view that you have that a synthetic view that you have conforms to the real world absolutely otherwise you're going to be creating real big problems um so it's i think the level of sophistication of technology in that area is still relatively primitive there's but it's advancing rapidly and if you've looked at the advancement in quality of virtual reality consumer virtual reality headsets it sort of shows that we're getting there very quickly. So I'd expect to see it happening fairly soon. Okay, um, we have, um, well, we have a lot. Um, Jordans, um, when it comes to automations uh, versus pilots, do you think automation is the, in the cockpit? Nowadays tends to make pilot over, over rely on it and lost the skill of hand flying the plane? <laughs> I will refer you to my PhD thesis. <laughs> It is entitled The Loss of Manual Flying Skills in Pilots of Highly Automated Airliners. Um, yeah, look, automation's a mixed bag. Uh, it's, it's been brilliant for safety of aviation. It has enabled us to get rid of a lot of um, smaller errors that were causing problems and actually to have a much safer operation and to reduce the workload of crew in certain situations. So I would never downplay the role of automation at all. But that, yeah, there is a risk that certain things which the crew used to do a lot, they don't do anymore. And, and therefore they don't get to practice. And we've now got evidence to show that that can lead to a degradation in their skills. The question therefore becomes is which direction we're going in? Is that important? Are we, um, we're kind of at a halfway house system at the moment where the automation is not good enough to guarantee that it's gonna work perfectly all the time. And so sometimes we'll need to revert to the human to take control. Um, until we're at a point where we can say that actually the automation can do its job perfectly reliably, 
um, and then leave the human to do whatever it does very well, rather than having to be a backup to the system, then we're always going to be in this bind. Um, and automation is getting better at doing its job, but at the minute, the two the systems still are too fragile to cope. So, um, yes, there is a very real risk that pilots lose their manual flying skills. How we maintain that is a challenge, um, and it's part of a training challenge as well. So we've got to think about intelligent about the way we we design our training systems, and maybe the way we design future generations of automation that. Um, manual control isn't what it used to be. Like if you look at the, I keep referring to spacecraft in this, but it's interesting. If you look at the, um, the dragon, um, uh, man, the um, dragon, the manned dragon capsule that's just gone up to the space station now, it doesn't really have manual control anymore. I mean, it doesn't have a traditional sense. I can take a joystick and now take control of the automation of the vehicle. You have to, you can do through a set of backup systems, go to like a cursor control system on the screen, but that isn't manual from a pilot's point of view. Manual from a, an astronaut's point of view is now having to set small, low level commands into the system. Um, and I don't think we'll see the next generation of automated vehicle, like air taxis, really, um, EV tall airplanes. I don't think we'll see them designed with what we will call traditional manual controls anymore. Um, it will be like the auto, it'll be like the manual gearbox in the car, right? Um, I learned to drive in a manual car. Nowadays, you go, I, I can't remember the last time I got into a car with a manual gearbox, to be honest with you. Um, future generations that are le- people that are learning to drive won't know what a manual gearbox is. They'll just know what an automatic gearbox is. And in fact, very soon, they probably won't know what car controls are like. So we'll see the same thing happening in aviation. And we've just got to think it through. Okay, so um, well, and another question from uh, Jordan again. Um, follow up the fly-by-wire referencing to the accidents of uh, Contest 70, uh, 72. The fly-by-wire auto flight system um, could go wrong and even override the pilot's input momentarily. Um, how do you comment on that? Yeah, it's uh, it's it was actually I cited the accident in my thesis because it happened about three days before I handed my PhD in. Um, so it was a scary accident, um, and it it highlights the role of authority and autonomy of control systems. How much authority do you give an automated system? Um, and in order to give something a high degree of authority, you have to be very convinced of its reliability. Um, I think with the I think what we saw with the um, the A330 there was a case where we thought we'd calculate a system that was incredibly reliable, yet we actually missed a, a common point of failure. Um, so when we think we've got, when we engineer redundancy into a system, we, we build reliability, but actually with that system and the way the systems were designed, it only took a rogue input from one of the flight sensors the, uh, I can't remember exactly how it went through the system, but it only took one bad input to actually trip the computer system up because of the way it failed. So um, I know I'm not really sure how I'm answering that question. I think it's a, it, in, I guess to get to the essence, if we're going to go to the point where automations, we're going to give automation more authority and more autonomy and let it do more and more and more, we absolutely have to be convinced of the reliability of it and the start, the the structure of automation systems at the moment probably won't give us that level of reliability. AI and systems that can more intelligently think around problems and when things like that happen, more intelligently filter out issues are probably the way ahead. But how do you certify, this is a really big question, how do you certify an AI system? So this goes from deterministic to non-deterministic. So when I, a deterministic system, an automation system is one that I can design, draw it on a piece of paper, and I know in situation A, this is exactly how it's going to behave. This is how it's going to perform. What's and all, if it's good or if it's bad. If we go to a system that sort of thinks by itself, we lose that ability. We say, we lose a lot of the ability to predict how it's going to perform. And therefore, how do you regulate and say it is safe or it is not safe if you don't know what it's going to do? Um, that's a huge challenge. So regulating automation, that's going to be where it's at as well. Yes, um, that was that was my uh, examination question, actually. Um, 
I feel like this is a thesis, Viber. This is really hard. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, software certifications on, on the AI. Yes. Um, uh, as, I think we have time for one last question. Um, let me just pick one from the last four. Um, might be, I think that one would sum up the everything. Uh, if a single pilot flight deck is realized, do you expect that there will be a specialist from other professional field, for example, uh, AI specialists uh, sitting in the club? Um, in the cockpit or not, I don't think so. I think the whole aim of um, the whole aim of the task is to get less of the workforce in the cockpit on the aeroplane. But absolutely, I think that the job of a pilot will look very different, both on the aeroplane and on the ground. Um, I think that there will be different divisions between what are existing. So at the minute, you have like a flight dispatcher on the ground as well, which is essentially a pilot that just doesn't get in the aeroplane. They do all the pre-flight stuff and you've got to pilot in the airplane. I think those sorts of job divisions are going to change, and I think there will be different roles created. What they will look like, I don't quite know. Go and read some of the NASA um, publications recently where they postulate what different shapes of systems might look like. Um, they're fascinating, and it hasn't been decided yet. So, yeah, absolutely, the jobs will look different. What they will look like, not quite sure at the moment. Okay, so I think that's um that's all we have time for 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 today. I think uh, thank you very much, Matt. This is a uh, well fun. answer for all the questions, and some of the questions are very challenging and very thank technical. Thank you for the audience. That was the most stimulated my brain has ever been. I think <laughs> that was really good. Fun. That would be a lot of and we still have a few questions to answer. I think we will answer offline. Okay, cool. Yes, <laughs> write them yes. down. I'll write some answers out. Yes, and I'll pass back to Joey and anything. Yeah, and uh, thanks very much for you know uh, Matt and um, and Tommy in Melbourne, right? Right now that is uh, they are two hours ahead of us, and uh, so thanks for sharing, and also thanks for all the you know participants for your great um, you know contribution of uh, very good questions. So you are also welcome to leave us uh, some of your advice uh, of the topic which you are interested. So we will because uh, currently we are collaborating with. Uh, Swinburne University to offer the Bachelor uh, you know, of Aviation Management degree program. So we, we, we are planning ahead to, you know, to organize a lot of uh, meaningful uh, YouTube sessions so that uh, for live session, or might be when the situation allowed because they will come to Hong Kong to teach so that we might organize some, uh, you know, a face-to-face -face, uh, sharing as well so that you can also chit chat with us. So please, uh, you are welcome to leave us a more, you know, idea what you are interested in the topic with us. So, and uh, coming ahead, uh, so this is the second webinar session that is a, um, a joint offer with uh, between Hong Yu Space and the Springburn University. So coming soon, I would like to also share with you all that we are uh, going to have, a, today is a quite a more technical um, uh, sharing and coming soon, we are going to have uh, some fun topic that is uh, for uh, other, you know, target groups. So if you're interested, you're welcome to join. So uh, stay tuned with us particularly to our Facebook. Uh, so we will have uh, some podcasts. That is uh, some interesting topic uh, related to the uh, aviation as well. Um, our students and teachers will also share the experience and, uh, and their you know, uh, career right now in the aviation industry. So you are also welcome to join. So uh, once again, and thanks very much for Tommy and Matt for your time and for all the audience uh, contribution. And thank you very much again. Okay, and hope to see you guys soon and looking forward to your suggestion on the topics. Okay, thanks very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. 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 Huh. Hi, Matt. Ooh. That was great, right? Yeah, sorry about disappearing for a minute in the middle of the, the cat. Oh, no, no, no.